The supply chain uh, for food in both emerging markets and in the United States and in Western Europe has been transforming extremely quickly and in fundamental ways. The new perspective that, that we have on supply chain is that every time that someone comes with an idea and this idea can be a new technology, a new product, a new location now to produce a product, to produce a product, for example, the innovation may be to start producing flour in Kenya or uh, chicken in Arkansas or uh, biofuel in Thailand. Then, once you have the supply chain, the question is how you implement it, how you move uh, to reality. So whoever has uh, control the idea basically has to think, how can I make money out of it? If uh, new companies enter the market, or if a company would like to enter a market with a new product, how do you do this within a globalized world? What is important is to recognize that uh, all food products have different attributes and uh, retailers have responded to their designing supply chains depending on the specific attributes of uh, the product. Uh, the idea behind the, the conference was to bring experts from all over the world that, to tell us about how different supply chains work, uh, work. First we try to speak about our conceptual understanding of supply chain, some of the issues that I, I raised here, how, uh, be, how innovators have to make some very difficult decisions that are constrained optimization, how to allocate the resources, to what extent to contract out, to what extent to be vertically integrated, to what extent to sell to final consumer, to what extent to operate through, uh, through intermediary. And then we try to look at different markets, what really happened, what happened in different industries. Most predictions are that we need to double our food production by 2050, and, uh, and frankly we're not on pace to doing that. If you, if you project out uh, growth curves for the leading staple commodities, they're not on pace to do that. Now, think something could happen um, in, uh, in the ensuing years. We could get a productivity jump that uh, something similar to that, what was associated with the Green Revolution, but that's uh, not happening now. Productivity in the last two decades, agricultural productivity is at a, at a much lower pace than it was uh, in the decades preceding that, which was stimulated by the Green, by the green Revolution. Uh, some people are hypothesizing, for example, David Zilberman at this conference, that it has been, uh, that the uh, stultification of the, uh, of the use of GMOs has been, uh, been a primary factor. I mean, GMOs are un un unquestionably in the different applications, productivity enhancing and uh, their growth has been curtailed by bans, for example, in the European Union. Now we're increasingly having uh, um, some, you know, some private buyers saying they don't want to GMOs, even though there really is no medical evidence that there's uh, any harm associated with GMOs. So, you know, that's an example where public policies have come into play that have diminished uh, agricultural productivity. I don't believe it's organic farming can really meet the world uh, food demand. Population is growing. What will happen is it will destroy the forest. Uh, there is a limited amount of resources in the world. We would like to keep as much wilderness to for wildlife. Human cannot control the world. Uh, E.O. Wilson, the great biologist, would say that they divide the world 50% for us and 50% for other species. How can we do it if we need to feed all these people and we use organic, we need our lawyer, and they will we need much more uh, material for fertilizer. So my feeling is that the good thing about modern systems is that they increase in produce efficiency, so you can use Less, you can get more output per drop of water, more output per an acre of land. So my feeling is science can be used by farmers, by small farmers, can increase health, can increase safety and will reduce our footprint. So in this result I think that uh, a lot of time innovation results in supply chain that may result in more efficient use of land. And the reality is that in the U.S. we use less than now than we used in 1918, about once, what, 20 percent less land. And that's the challenge, to use less land and to grow more output. 
and we do it by science-based and knowledge-based systems that result in rational supply chain that allow farmer to produce valuable product, industry to process it, and consumer consume it in a way that it, that it helps it. But the design of the supply chain is a big challenge and that's what we wanted to learn in this conference. From my perspective, involved in global agriculture, that I believe the planet can produce enough food to, to, to feed seven, nine billion inhabitants that we will get by 2050. The challenge is working with developing countries, agriculture, to get the investments both in production, to get the fertilizers available, to get the processing capability there to convert grains into food products. Mm -hmm. uh, this, w this will require uh, good policies, investments by local countries in infrastructure, roads. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the problems in Ethiopia is just to get the fertilizer out to the fields, mm -hmm. to get the production back into the cities. Mm -hmm. I say Ethiopia, I don't want to say, uh, I don't want to pick on any country, but infrastructure is really critical to get the productivity of their good agricultural lands up. What we need to do is optimize the productivity in our sustainable acres so that we can reduce the demand on production from non-sustainable acres. Mm -hmm. But in order to do this, again, this takes investment, takes transfer of technology, takes uh, extension services, uh, and uh, this is, is our challenge going forward. Accepting the challenge to feed the world is a real big challenge. And a lot of the young people in this room are going to be responsible for feeding the world. They only have 35 growing seasons to do that between now and 2050. And they're going to have to feed 9.7 billion by current forecast. They're going to have to ship and transfer twice as much food as we see today. The important part is to find these prodigies. And I call them prodigies. And the beauty of it is that we have no shortage in this room of intelligent young people who have said, I raise my hand. I, I want to learn what these old guys know. And I'm willing to step up. I told them it's a 24-7 job. And in some cases, you don't get paid a lot. We've been talking about a quiet revolution where the supply chains are, uh, are transforming, uh, driven by tens of thousands of small entrepreneurs that are making investments all along the supply chain. And also a modern revolution where supermarket chains, both from developed countries and also from the regions, are competing and investing and changing the whole face of the supply chain and of the food markets. So <clears throat> given that, really that earthquake of change of, uh, within the food markets, <clears throat> entrepreneurs as well as the researchers and policymakers have to reassess what their strategies are uh, for both making a business and, and a business that makes money but also makes a difference in people's lives uh, researchers who want to really be on the cutting edge to understand what should be the key issues that they're focusing on focusing on to inform policymakers to inform business to push the uh, the domains of science and understanding what how markets are changing and also then policymakers to create enabling environments for businesses to uh, and farmers to make adjustments within this new world. The, the US food industry is becoming uh, increasingly concentrated in all sectors production and marketing and retailing and it's also becoming increasingly vertically coordinated uh, across all the stages so as part of this transformation, uh, food retailers have probably become the dominant players in the food system and uh, their 
wishes and the market signals that they transmit uh, upstream to manufacturers and uh, food manufacturers and farmers are probably the most significant factor in the food chain. And then as part of that, this is all part and parcel of the vertical coordination which has involved the elimination of a lot of so-called middlemen. Um, uh, wholesalers are a much less important element in most industries now and then, than they were in the past, with products <coughs> excuse me, moving either directly from grower shippers to retailers or from growers to manufacturers to retailers, with far fewer intermediaries and much closer connections with, uh, with products usually exchanged by contracts instead of uh, cash or spot type markets. The supply chain for our company went all the way from growing the lettuce to harvesting it, packing it, mm -hmm. and using some new technology called <laughs> modified atmosphere to preserve it. Everyone's interested in shipping less weight because that translates to less fuel. Mm -hmm. And so what we were able to do was actually leave about six, about 35% of the lettuce, the head lettuce, in the field and just take the leaves that could be used for uh, packing salads. When we started, we basically just took whole heads of iceberg lettuce, put 24 heads in a box, mm -hmm. and sent it usually to some wholesaler, not a lot into retailers direct, generally through a third party. And today that's all gone. Mm. and we go directly to the supermarket chains, and that's been the big change, as well as pricing. When we started, uh, pricing was always based on supply and demand of lettuce. Now they're multi-year contracts based on a fixed amount of money over the period of the contract. And typically we try to buy direct. Um, typically as well, we really uh, our goal has always been that 75 to 80 percent of the items that we sell are major national branded items, it's like Thai detergents and Cheerios cereal, things like that. So that will on the foods that will always maintain probably 75 to 80 percent of the items that we that we work on. So that obviously is done by CPG companies. Um, the rest of our buying, which you know even in that regard, we try to eliminate. Uh, we don't have distributors. We typically have our own fleet of trucks that sometimes get pick up merchandise, we have our own depot system, so we try to eliminate any other steps between the manufacturing and then our final building. So we try to eliminate those steps even with those big companies. Um, in examples like I talked about today with international products, quinoa, grains, commodity type items, we are trying to eliminate a lot more steps out of the supply chain to buy as direct as possible. Um, like I said, I would describe it as a pyramid structure between the farmers, the processors, and Costco. Those three together is really what we want to whittle down to. That's the strongest formation uh, that we can do, and it offers the most value back to the farmers, um, and that's really our goal. The same thing that occurred very slowly in the United States over, let's say, 1880 to now, 150 years, uh, in terms of the rise of packaged food and processing industry, <clears throat> really wasn't there before the 1880s. And the rise of the supermarkets that really wasn't there before the 1920s, 1930s, and then slowly, you know, gained ground here in the U.S. Uh, to the point where now most of supermarkets and, and much is dominated by large food processors. Um, this, this same thing that happened gradually in the United States <clears throat> has happened lightning fast in emerging markets. The idea to have uh, certain sustainability aspects or ethical aspects uh, that can be promoted in the behavior of shopping and along the supply chain of how it is produced are definitely a very important discussion that should be led uh, since we are uh, sourcing in a worldwide market and some markets, uh, third world countries, uh, the sourcing has to uh, has to be done in a very fair way and uh, those markets should not be exploited uh, by our Western uh, consumption behavior. We are fostering the discussion uh, around those topics and by having the discussion very publicly and very open and uh, looking at it from all sides, we are contributing uh, to the arguments that are in the market. Uh, some people like the arguments, others don't like the arguments, but this will lead to further discussions.
so we are a, a catalytic uh, uh, think tank that is opening the discussion to look at both sides of the coin, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, and then people can make their decisions on what they are um, preferring and what they don't. We are not focusing on single uh, detailed topics, we are trying to see the whole process chain and see the uh, complexity and try to make it understandable uh, in the discussion so that we are not being driven uh, by uh, ideas that only look at a certain segment but that uh, take into consideration uh, the whole way from farm to folks. So to speak. I hope that we will develop a, a annual workshop every year that people will come to Berkeley and this workshop will be a dialogue between the researcher, industry and practitioners. Uh, so we will have a, we have a leading a scholar and industry that will make some presentation. There will be more interactive discussion with, with, the, with, the, with some of the particip paying participants that will come to learn. And I think that the net effect will be that there will be much more awareness on uh, the potential of uh, supply chain and how to utilize them effectively. This conference has been about supply chains. Mm -hmm. And if you see, if you talk about firms like Sunkist or Ocean Spray um, or um, Blue Diamond or Florida Natural or Lando Lakes, they're all leaders in their supply chain, which means they're integrated backwards um, to the farm. The farmers own them, and they in turn own the collection stations and then a number of them have integrated forward even more into processing. Mm -hmm. And from processing, developing uh, sophisticated or well-known brand names. And um, so, wow, they, they become chain leaders, per se. Mm -hmm. And so these, these type of um, cooperatives who've lived, existed for more than 100 years, have really found the success. They, they know when subgroups within the membership maybe are getting upset mm -hmm. and they know how to address those concerns and continue regenerating. Rabobank started off as a farmer's cooperative, so agriculture is in, in, in the DNA and, um, and as also being a Dutch uh, origin institution, international trade uh, was the other part of the DNA. So the combination of international trade and uh, focus on food and agribusiness um, you know, gives us, as I said, you know, that, that unique perspective and we've invested a lot in, in terms of research and knowledge. If you don't look at the whole value chain, you know, you're, 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 we've, our experience has shown that you will fail. You know, either the, um, the offtake will not work or the products will not, uh, you know, get, it will not be of the right kind and quality that are needed in the export markets or something else will, or the contracts will not work. So I think you have to look at the whole value chain. I wish there was a grand plan, but uh, you know, I, I think the problem is real that we have to, you know, it's, it's about, as, as you said, it's about um, creating the capacity to grow that that food with with less resources mm -hmm. because we have we're going to have less less land definitely less land per capita we we're going to have less water available so to create that you know, capacity to grow you know that extra amount of food that is needed and then to get it to where it's needed mm -hmm. uh, i think that's the big opportunity so that's on that, that's on on the wall um, how do we get there i think it will it will take a lot of care so that's why we focus so much on creating partnerships across the board. We talked about the patient procurement program that we now have in, in Africa. We've got 10 partners. So I, I think the, you know, I don't think there is a prescribed way right now, but I think it is very clear that a lot of um, players will have to cooperate and come together and collaborate to make it happen, and we are we are doing that. The issue is no longer access to money. The world is awash with money. The driver of the global food system, besides demographics and population, that's the demand. The supply side is land with water. Because if you don't have land with water, you can't meet the economic needs of the business and provide the products to the public. This is a tremendous challenge. Um, 
to increase uh, the food production to meet the demands that we may face by the year 2050. And it's more than, yeah, some say doubling, it might be tripling depending on how uh, our demand will uh, develop. The supply chains are very dynamic, so that is a challenge for us as economists who model supply chains. We have uh, to take these uh, dynamics into consideration for developing our models. So that implies that some of the models that we have used have been very much comparative. And for a number of questions that might be appropriate, but for many questions when uh, dynamics play a role, customer behavior, uh, behavior within agents along the supply chain, then comparative static models um, are not appropriate anymore to capture all the important issues and then uh, dynamic models become more important. But we are now at the, the forefront of research developing such kind of uh, dynamic models. So this is uh, a research agenda I think that will uh, take uh, a number of years uh, and will be uh, quite fruitful for uh, generating new insights that might not only be interesting for participants within the supply chain but also for policy makers. I don't think that supply, that you have a lot of supply chain policies per se. What you have, you have a range of agricultural and economic policy that allow people to build more efficient and reasonable supply chain and also more equitable supply chain. So smart antitrust law combined with science-based regulation, combined with good educational system, combined with better regulation of water and combined with environmental policy that are science-based and effective, for example, car carbon tax and compensation for a positive uh, contribution to environment while penalizing negative contribution. All of these are very important to enhance uh, our system. Village Taobao is the initiative where Alibaba had uh, for the rural development. Uh, we try to apply the e-commerce uh, uh, to really get into the villages uh, to help the farmers and the customers in villages to buy goods from uh, the online platform like Taobao, TMO, uh, because of the information, because of the payment, uh, digital payment, and also because of the logistic issues, uh, uh, people in villages uh, are not able to really uh, do the online shopping. So we wanted to uh, establish a middle tier. So this model is called a B2B2C. We try to inject a middle tier, small b, to really help extend the uh, B2C coverage into uh, the villages. The extension of the online platform into villages is the first step. We mainly try to establish the trust for online business into villages. And at the same time, try to build the infrastructure for the logistic. So the next step, we try to sell production materials directly into the uh, villages so to reduce the cost and improve the efficiency for the agricultural production. Then we also try to help the farmers to reuse this kind of infrastructure to sell the products out because currently uh, people don't really have the logistic to carry their products out efficiently. So they just have to sell whatever uh, people uh, go to the villages. And finally, we wanted to utilize this uh, uh, middle tier for the village finance, so to have a loan to the villagers, uh, to farmers, uh, quickly and reliably uh, to help them to uh, produce. I really think that the issue is much more poverty than it is food security in a classical sense. So I said there are three ways of looking at food security. The most germane really is at a family level, and that is based on income. The other one that is often people looked at is from a national level. What can the government do to ensure food security for their people? And some governments don't like the idea of accepting that there will be move more food security from interdependence on the globes or the planet's production basements. They want production in their country. I think this is a mistake also. Uh, 
There are some countries that have the environmental comparative advantage of producing a lot of food, and yet you go to some countries, uh, Egypt, uh, countries in the Middle East, not to pick on any one country, but their environmental situation is, is that they don't have environmental comparative advantage to be self-sufficient. Uh, and if they are trying to be self-sufficient, that would not be uh, the best way to optimize the production basins of the planet. Uh, so the three different ways, sometimes the confusion about food security is one person is looking at from a planet's ability to produce, another person is talking about from a nation's food policies, and finally the father of a family who's living on 78 cents a day is saying, I don't care what you guys are talking of, I don't have food security for my family because I cannot afford to buy them what might be available or what generally is available in town. The wise leaders study subgroups and how can, how can we bring about a singleness of purpose that will reunite uh, these subgroups and reduce maybe emerging factions into friction into a home, more homogeneous group.